Tonight we have in the studio Leah Veralcard, the Taoiseach. He used to be a regular on the programme while he was uh, in the opposition, when he first went into the Dáil, actually. And then less often on the programme while he was Minister. And, but I'm glad you're on the programme now. You're the first Taoiseach we've had on the programme, so uh, you're Thank very you. welcome. Delighted to be here. Be here. I, I started <laughs> off, of course, on, on your, your radio show. Uh, an RT a very long time ago. Not if you remember that. But, uh, I, don't, I, I, in, I mix up the radio programme and this programme. I, can't, uh, I often can't remember which. Later we'll be joined by Mario Rosenstock. Um, also Mary Louise O'Donnell, Independent Centre, owner, Marco Broadcaster, Michelle Murphy, Social Justice Ireland. Uh, and we're also going to be joined uh, for an assessment of Leo and his performance on the programme this evening by Enda Kenny. Um, that's the surprise. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a joke. <laughs> yeah, well, I was happy there for a second. <laughs> uh, on the tweet machine, we have Gavin Riley, political correspondent of Today FM and also of News Talk. If you'd like to come to the programme, you can text us at 53131, uh, followed by our uh, comment or send us a tweet at hash and be our email at tonight at tv3.e. Let's ask a few pre preparatory questions. We'll go to a break, then we'll get into the nitty gritty. Do you enjoy being Taoiseach? I do. It's a um, it's steep learning curve, but it's uh, fascinating so far, really interesting. Every day is different, and it's been, um, been very enjoyable so far. Um, I'm very conscious, though, of the responsibilities that I have, the enormous opportunity it is to change things, and um, also the great privilege it is. And I'm d determined over the next months and years ahead to prove to people that, um, that I deserve the office that I hold by, by governing well and by governing in the interests um, of all the people of Ireland, and that's what I... That's what I want to do. I'm sure there are many people who were as capable or more capable than me that didn't have the opportunity to hold this office. Uh, so I want to prove that I deserve it and uh, do as good a job as I can. Uh, do you feel a bit out of your depth? Um, no, uh, I don't. Um, that's not to say that I'm not challenged and I, and I don't understand uh, the enormity of the job that's ahead of me, but uh, I'm very well supported. Uh, it's a department teaching is a very good department, very well run, uh, and I have a, a good team of people who I've uh, assembled through my career in politics and some people I've brought in. So uh, The reason I ask that is not, not an adverse comment on you. It's, it's because I think that looking back on Taoiseach that they did find time, that it did take them time. Remember, uh, Charlie Hoy took a long time to... to uh, Jack, Jack Lynch was a bad Taoiseach for a long time. Um, Garrett, I think, had difficulties in getting into the role. I think Charlie Hoy did. I think uh, Bertie did. Uh, uh, and John Bruton and Brian Conn. I think they all have found it difficult initially. I'm surprised you don't. I think it's. Um, um, I think it's, it's. It's a very different role. Obviously, if you're a minister, you're one of fifteen or, or one of twenty. Um, when your teacher is only one of you, and you're a little bit apart from uh, the group that used to be uh, your peer group. Um, and uh, I imagine there will be some very difficult days and difficult weeks ahead. But. Um, um, but uh, like I say, it's, uh, it's, it's fascinating, it's interesting, every day has been different um, and I'm learning a lot. Um, when you're in a government department, you can become quite siloised, you know a lot about that department, but sometimes you're not following everything that's going on in the news. I find myself now, once again, uh, having to you know, read about international affairs, read about Northern Ireland, um, you know, read about things that I wouldn't have read about for a couple of years, you know, for example, energy policy, and that's got the kind of brain ticking over and firing again and uh, that's that's been one of the most enjoyable parts of the job so far you, you train for for triathlons why do you do that i, I know you want to do it for fitness and all that but why mm. some, some piece extreme is triathlons oh, I, I don't do extreme triathlons i do i do uh, sprint triathlons and um and interval training so i try to train four times a week usually usually first thing in the morning and um, first, first thing in the morning what time do you get up in the morning um about six forty-five. wouldn't mm. be uh, that, un that wouldn't be that unusual, uh, certainly not in suburban Dublin. But um, did I, you I do get up at six forty-five, by the way. No, no, I used to be used to be more of a more of a night owl, but I kind of kind of changed. But my, you my got routine. into the doll first, did you get up early? Um, when I was working as a doctor, I did obviously because I had to. Um, when I was in the doll, uh, I tend to get up a bit later and work very late. But in the last couple of years, I've changed. Because, uh, because uh, you didn't have a, a uh, reputation for getting up early in the morning, in the early years in the doll. No, it would have been would have been uh, somebody worked very late. People would have talked yeah, about me sending emails yeah. at two a.m. and three a.m. But and, um, and coming in around half nine and things. Uh, yeah, but I got fit in, in well. the meantime. Um, and uh, so what, what I do now is is I, I try to train 
first thing in the morning and get into work. And you ask me why I do it, I really do it for two reasons. First, first of all, to keep in shape. But secondly, I think training and sport and physical activity is really good for mental health. It's, it's an opportunity to, um, you know, escape essentially from the worries of your day or the things you're concerned about. Uh, and it gives you some, some headspace and some thinking time. And you know, running and exercise and swimming does that. And I know a lot of people who say that, uh, that, that it helps, um, actually helps with the rest of the day. OK, we're going to take a break. After the break, we'll get into the nitty-gritty. Join us then. Welcome back. Leo, at the start of your leadership campaign to be leader of Fine Gael, you said that you wanted to represent the people who get up early in the morning. What did you mean by that? Yeah, well, it's a, it's a metaphor, of course, that applies just as much to somebody who works late, who's uh, coming in now um, after working all day or heading out even to do the night shift. And what it refers to is um, effectively 2 million people who um, work in Ireland for a living, 1.5 million who are uh, paying income tax, who work very hard, who contribute a huge amount to the country in terms of tax and also in terms of the work that they do. Um, it's the middle class, it's Middle Ireland, and it's a group of people who often feel that they contribute a lot to the economy and a lot to society, but maybe they don't get as much back for it as they should. Um, they're on the wrong side of the means test when it comes to medical cards or free health care. They get no housing support. They have to provide uh, their own housing. Um, up until recently, they would have lost out on childcare subsidies. Uh, and I think they're the people who make everything possible in this country and they need to know that government is on their side and I want to be on their side and I want to raise their living standards. That's, I think a lot of people find that quite disturbing. You said you wanted to represent the middle class and want to be on the side of the middle class. If that means anything, it means you're not on the side of people who are not middle class. No, it doesn't. And that's, well, of course it does. No, it, it doesn't and that's, that, that's, a, that's a classic tactic. A, a classic tactic, l largely something used, uh, used by the left. Uh, where it's actually an Ar one of Aristotle's 12 fan uh, fallacies. So what you do is you take something somebody said, you say what they really mean is this other thing, no, no. and you attack them for that. No, I didn't say what you really mean. I'm just taking what you said. That if you said you want to represent the middle class, you didn't say you want to represent everybody. You said you want to represent the middle class because you regard them as contributing so much to society, not getting much back. That leaves out a lot of other people. No, it doesn't. It, it would leave out other people if I said that I solely want to represent... Uh, the middle class. But of course, that's, my, that's my, 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 that's job, my job. My job as teacher, the job of any government, of course, is to represent uh, all people. Except, work for but why did you say at the beginning of your campaign for the leadership that you wanted to represent the middle class rather than saying that you wanted to represent everyone? Yeah, because I think that uh, they deserve more representation and their group in society that I want to give extra attention to. More representation than whom? Um, more representation than they're getting at the moment, no. and that's that's and you know the, the same thing would, would apply. You would have people in here, for example, uh, who come in here who may advocate, we'll say, for people who are homeless. You wouldn't say to them, uh, you don't care about people who have problems with their mortgages. You don't care about people uh, who have homes already. That's not no, the case. No, you no, know, it, it, it doesn't mean that, but it means pri it, it suggests priorities, and that by saying that you want to represent the middle class right at the beginning of the campaign, you, said it, the, you convey, and I assume, assume you mean, that you give priority to representing the middle class. A greater priority than they've had to date, uh, because largely they're a group um, that I believe isn't represented well enough in politics. Uh, they're people who um, do so much for the state in terms of the work they do, the taxes that they pay, and I would like to see that their standards and living standards be raised. That is not at the expense of others. And, you know, if you, if you don't, don't listen to my words in that regard, um, look at my record, for example, as Minister of Social Protection uh, brought in across the board welfare increases for 800,000 people for the first time in seven or eight years. People with disabilities, carers, the blind, lone parents, widows, uh, had an increase um, in, in, in their weekly payments. When I was in health, for example, uh, bringing in free GP care to kids under six and people over 70 on a universal basis. So, you know, my, my record is pretty clear on these things. Uh, but it is my view uh, that people who work in, in, in our society, people who contribute to our economy, who pay a lot of tax, who work very hard, uh, need a government that stands up for them. And I don't think that that's happened enough in the past. Uh, I gave you, before we came on air, a, a document I got from the, from the Revenue Commissioners today. It's on the CSO website. And it, uh, you have it there. Uh, or do you? Um, no. Um, well, there it is. And you have, have my analysis of it. Um, I, I, I gave you, yeah, you have them both. And um, you can see that... Who are the middle class, in your view? Um, 
I said, I said middle class and middle Ireland, so it's broader than the middle class. Um, it's essentially um, the, the big centre, if you like, uh, of, of Irish society. People are earning from what to what? No, I haven't. I've never, I've never put, put figures out. In well, it, well, it hardly means, and it doesn't mean much unless you put figures out. But let's say you mean people from uh, earning between 35 and 70, 35,000 and 70,000. Let's say that. Would you yeah, yeah, well, no, not necessarily. It's something I've never put figures on, but um, depending on how you calculate average income in Ireland, you know, it's between 35 and 40 something thousand. So I, I would go much broader than that. I would include, for example, people who are on the minimum wage, uh, people who work, you know, very hard but would be earning. They're not uh, middle less class. People no, in the middle are, wage are not middle class. What, over 70 percent of people describe themselves as middle class, and um, <laughs> I, I, people and, on the minimum and, wage and middle don't Ireland is even it. middle Ireland is even broader again. Uh, yeah. People on the minimum wage don't describe themselves, unless they're in fantasy, they don't describe themselves as middle class. Well, over 70% of people do, including a lot of people who are pensioners, for example. Where did you come across that? It's, it's a, it's a sta standard statistic, if you ask people. Um, for example, you, you, you asked about the phrase, uh, getting up early in the morning, when people were asked in, in polls, after I used that term, by the way, not before, we didn't do any research on it, uh, over 60% of people uh, identified as... Um, being in that group, being, being the people I'm talking about, and mentioning minimum wage, for example, uh, only in the last five and a half years since we've been in office, uh, we've increased minimum wage on four occasions. Um, we'll increase it again, uh, having just announced that in January. So I'm very much talking about people uh, who are in low pay as well. They'd be very much part of the group of people that I'm talking to, people whose who's living standards I want to improve. People in low pay are not middle class. Well, they're middle Ireland then. There's certainly people who get up early in the morning, and that is the phrase I used. But you use the phrase now of middle class. Middle class okay. and middle Ireland. And, but just look at the figures that I gave you. Uh, people earning between 35 and, and 40,000 a year pay 13% of, of their income in income tax and in USC. Five, uh, 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 40 to 50,000 paying 16%. 50 to 60,000, 19%. And even pay, people paying, uh, who, who are earning... Uh, 275,000 and over, and who have an average income of 638,000, they're paying just 42% of their income in tax. So the idea that people are, are crucified by tax is just not true. Yeah, I've, I've never used the term crucified, but there are people who pay a lot of tax uh, in our country. You only gave this to me um, the moment I came in, but there are three obvious flaws that I see in it, having only looked at it for a few moments. First of all, this isn't individuals, these are tax cases. That's right, so yeah, they and, include, it could be, and it could um, convey a worse situation yeah, than I'm it, saying. Well, yes, yeah, so, so they include, for example, um, a married couple. And, you know, a married couple uh, on 60,000 <laughs> uh, could be two people earning 30,000, two people earning below average earnings. Um, you know, so it's important to know the difference between tax case and tax individuals. Uh, this doesn't include PRSI, so you'd, have, right, to, you'd have to add, add a, another 4% uh, to most of this column. And it doesn't include any other forms of taxation, and of course people no. are paying in VAT, uh, yeah. lots of, in VAT and excise yeah. and those yeah, taxes. Right. And but the idea is that a lot of people have the idea that they're paying, and I thought that you folks at your leadership campaign of those, paying, uh, paying uh, um, massive amounts of their income in taxation, and they're, they're the squeezed middle, as they as they like to be called. And it's just not true. And you have you have gone along with that. No, it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's true that a lot of people um, pay a lot of tax, and there's more to tax than income tax. <laughs> um, we can talk about that some more if you want. Um, but you know, one example that I, that, I, that I gave, and it's something that I, I do think is wrong, uh, is that people on pretty modest incomes um, Incomes of thirty and forty thousand, for example, and anything up from there, uh, will pay marginal rates of forty nine percent and fifty two in some cases. But the, but uh, why, is, why, why is the marginal rate important? Because in real world and in real life examples, it applies to the pay increase you get. It applies to right. the overtime you work. It applies to the bonus you might get, or applies to the promotion. And you're t and when people do work harder, when they do extra hours, okay. when they do overtime, when they get promoted, when they get a pay rise, um, middle-income people lose 49% of that. And to me, that's too much. OK. You talked about uh, a republic of opportunity. What do you mean? Uh, what I mean, it's a concept. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ideal. And what I mean by it is 
something that I want to build in Ireland, uh, a republic of opportunity. And what it means is two things. Um, the equal opportunity for everyone to succeed in their country, to do as well as they can, to be the best and most successful person that they can be. And secondly, it's about making sure that all regions and all parts of the country have an equal opportunity to share in our prosperity uh, and in our economic progress. And we don't have that country yet. That's the country that I'd like to build. If there's to be equal opportunity, there has to be huge investment in education, in housing, in dealing with problems of deprivation and poverty, uh, uh, in education and all of that. And this is far beyond anything that you could envisage happening within 10 years um, on, um, and under well, present no. policies. Well, no, and I really, really hope that's not the case. Um, because I think that is part of what's required. Certainly investment in education, yes, absolutely, um, uh, and investment in housing. Um, one of the things that we will do, for example, before the end of the year is publish a 10-year capital investment plan. For the first time in a long time, we're going to have an NDP, as it used to be called. Oh, that's an will, NDP, National Development National Plan. Yeah, and that will set out a capital investment plan um, probably in the region of 80 billion euros over 10 years. And that does provide for very significant uh, investment in housing investment in education, for example, um, and in other areas. So, yeah, we'll be planning for a country with a population of 5.5 million by 2040, and that is going to require lots of capital investment. And what I've said, uh, and it's there in the Constant Supply Agreement, we have the faults in our programme for government, is that when we are making a decision between how we allocate funds between tax relief and increased public spending, uh, we will break that down two to one. So for every one euro that we use to reduce the burden of taxation on middle-income people, we will use two uh, on public spending, and that will be directed to many of those areas. Um, and just, actually, just to give, you, to, give you, to give you two examples of things that are kicking in the next few weeks, and these are things that I would have been very much involved in <laughs> as a politician, the back-to-school clothing and footwear allowance is going up by 25%. That's going to help uh, 250,000 uh, low-income families, working families who are on low incomes and also people on welfare. Um, the back to, back to education allowance is being fully restored if you're under 25 and you take up education, that's being fully restored. The biggest single increase in the social welfare package last year was that. Uh, and also kicking in from the 1st of September are universal subsidies for childcare. Um, anyone who's got a kid between six months and three years old is going to have a universal subsidy for childcare. And that's important for two reasons. It reduces the cost of living for families, uh, but also uh, childcare and the cost of childcare is a huge barrier to opportunity for a lot of people uh, to get into the workforce, particularly lone parents. So these are exactly the kind of things that I'm talking about when I talk about a republic of opportunity. It's about giving people opportunities to better themselves. But in order to do that, you, for, for instance, have got to deal with the scale of inequality that we have in this society. For instance, the median income, and you know what the median income is, and just for our viewers, hmm. the average income is, say, if there are 10 people in a room and one person is paid two million and the rest are paid 50, 30, 40 and downwards. The average income is something in the region of well over 100,000. Um, but it's meaningless in terms of the total number of people in the room. The median income is the person in the middle. Now, in our society, the medium, the medium income, it's the medium equivalised income. I won't go into that, but that takes count of uh, a spouse and uh, our partner and, a, and children, is less than 20,000. Most of us couldn't live on less than 20,000. Could you? Um, I, I, would, I would certainly struggle to. I imagine I could, but I certainly would, would not be able to maintain the current standard of living I have. So, so, and, so yeah. the, and half the population are living on that or lower. Yeah, I'd have, to, I'd, have to, I'd have to look at those figures a bit, a bit more closely. There's, 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 you, you mentioned that yourself yeah. earlier no, there, there, are, there are different it's, figures. It's, like, it's, like, average earnings are in the region of 35,000 to 44,000, yeah, but that would different people in That's different, yeah. yeah. Uh, but you mentioned this. This is Silk, the Silk Report. Yeah. Um, so in order to deal with the Republic of Opportunity, unless you deal with the massive uh, disparities in income, it, hmm. means, it means very little. Yeah, well, it, it, it requires a number of things. Um, you know, for, but this is the Silk Report. It's the Silk Report in 2015. It's a document that I know very well. As you'll know, what it shows that Ireland as a country um, is about mid-range when it comes to inequality. It shows that we have uh, the most redistributive um, wealth tax and welfare system. <coughs> that, that doesn't sound that, but anyway. Well, it does actually. What the uh, other, what, the other, the what, other. Um, what has here is the, the, the our Gini Gini kind of Gini Gini yeah, right, which yeah. is which is. But which anyway, is, go on, so yeah, yeah, among yeah. the things that this document shows, which is from 2015. Uh, shows that we're becoming more e more equal 
um, the it, Gini Cook has gone down from 30 fractionally, to Fractionally, more. Yeah, but you know, the, the impression yeah. that, that some people create, particularly a lot of people who would come on your programme, is that we're becoming more unequal as a society. Actually, this, the, the most recent figures yeah. show that we're becoming more equal as a society. It's, it, fractionally uh, so. And shows, that, um, and shows that consistent poverty is, fa is, is now falling again, having gone but up it's, very it's, substantially. But it's very, very high. Uh, it's high, yeah, yeah. It's a lot higher than it was before the financial crisis. But the question is, how do you, if, if, if we if we both agree the same thing, we want consistent poverty to go down, and we want the country to become more equal in income terms. Um, we both agree that we're now going the right direction, having gone the wrong direction for for a long period. How do you deal with it? Um, not primarily, in my view, through th uh, through having an even more redistributive tax and welfare system, because we have one of the most redistributive tax and welfare systems it, already. Yeah, you do it through employment, uh, and you know, adding an extra five or ten euros to what people uh, earn um, every week through tax reductions or through increases in welfare is not the way to do it. <laughs> what you want is more jobs, more people in employment, better jobs, and people working more hours, and that's the real game changer. You can't can't do it on its own. Everyone isn't able to work. But certainly for those who can be in employment, that's the best route uh, out of poverty and the best way to give people financial independence. And what have we done the past six years? We've brought unemployment down from 15% to about 6% now, and we need to bring that down further. I want us to achieve full employment uh, in Ireland, but I also want people to have better jobs, uh, jobs that pay. Um, and that's why we increase the minimum wage on four occasions. Um, that's why we're bringing in legislation now, for example, uh, to deal with precarious employment to get rid of if and when contracts. That legislation is now at an advanced stage. And it's also why I'm very committed to do something around pension equality. Um, public servants uh, like me, almost 100% of us have guaranteed pensions, but in the private sector, 65% of people don't have an occupational pension at all. And I think uh, we should make those compulsory, as they are in other countries, like Britain, for example, where employers and employees are required to pay into their pension funds. So that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about when I talk about building a republic of opportunity. It's big stuff, and it's ambitious, and it's going to take time, but I really want to do it. Um, one of the recent uh, figures that came out, which I thought were interesting, was and to do with income tax, that although the number of people at work was going up, income tax has more or less stalled. And that would suggest that the reason it's stalled is because people are paid so little. And we know anyway, aside from that, that there, are, there is a huge growth in what is called precarious employment. People on very precarious contracts, we know that all of, from personal experience all over the place, and we know that people are paid very, very poor wages, the minimum wage. A lot of people are paid the minimum wage, and how people are able to live on the minimum wage is completely beyond me. People and com people complaining about a 30 cent rise in the minimum wage is bizarre. But you've got to deal with something, you've got to deal with that issue. You've got to deal with precarious employment. The minimum wage is pathetic, 9 950 or something it is now. Mm. Nobody could live on that. Why don't you put it up to a, well, at least the living wage, which would be 11 30 or something of that right? Well, first of all, the minimum wage is going up. It's gone up by 25% since uh, Fine Gael ca came to office. It'll continue to rise. We've set a target of bringing it up to about 10.50 an hour during this period of, uh, during this, th this period of government. Um, uh, we are bringing legislation around if and when contracts, uh, which is one of the things that you've mentioned. I want to bring in universal access to pensions. So a lot of those things um, are, are being done for a start. Um, and obviously tax reduction can be part of that too. Uh, and also... But you're hardly paying any... People on the minimum wage are not paying income tax. Um, they would pay USC if they're working full-time. Because uh, uh, USC... Just gets, about, US, but yeah, it's a, a tiny amount about of USC. But one of the so, better, so the tax reductions don't mean anything to them. Yeah, one of the better things you can do uh, for that group, and again, something I talked about um, in my paper, and I demonstrated uh, in my last department, is improving social insurance-related benefits. Uh, so, for example, we brought in paternity benefit for that group. Um, one of the things that is coming back only in October is people getting their dental benefits back. Um, it sounds like a small thing, but it's actually important to people. Uh, you used to, from your PRSI, uh, be able to attend the dentist for free, have your teeth cleaned, have an oral exam, have them polished and scaled. That comes back in, in October. One of the areas I'd like to restore uh, is sick pay. A lot of people who are getting up early in the morning, who are working hard, um, if they become sick, their employers don't provide any sick pay for them at all, uh, unless they've been out, out sick for more than... And it's only when they've been out sick for more than five days, for example, they can then claim back from the PRSI system. I'd like to improve that. Uh, so what you can do for people who are working hard, who are low-paid, who are in that group, is actually improving work-related social insurance benefits. For people who are um, middle to higher income, uh, you can allow them to have more money in their pockets by reducing the taxes they pay. It seems unlikely that after the next election, I, I, either Fianna Gael or Fianna Fáil will have an overall majority. In fact, they'll be significantly, on the basis of the opinion, significantly short of an overall majority.
And the only prospect of entering a government would either be, uh, uh, having a majority government would either be a coalition between Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael, which seems entirely improbable because Fianna Fáil don't want to leave their door open to Sinn Féin as the major opposition party. Uh, so the uh, only other option is coalition with Sinn Féin, and Sinn Féin, I think, are gagging for it. And you've ruled them out. Why? Um, I think we're far too far apart in terms of policy. Um, uh, you know, we're uh, a globalist, internationalist, pro-European party. They're, they're nationalist. Um, they're anti-European. Um, what do you mean? They're, 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 they used to be anti-European. They're not anti-European now. They, they want uh, Northern Ireland to be part of the European Union, for instance. Yeah, well, having opposed Ireland being part of the European Union, oh, right. Euro, yes, right. yes. Yeah, so right. I, I don't, I don't, I don't understand that position. That all of a sudden, having been opposed to the European Union forever, they now don't want Northern Ireland to leave it. But you can ask them that question. Also, we have a very different uh, view on the economy, uh, on supporting business. Um, they're a country that. A party, for example, that wants to, wants to, to raise taxes on, on lots of people. We, we don't want to do that at all. So I think we're too... But you too have to raise taxes. Posture. For you to achieve a, a Republic of Opportunity, you can't do it without at least raising some taxes. It can't be done. Yeah, I, I, that, that, I, I, first of all, I don't accept that. Um, secondly, uh, that does depend on other things. It depends, for example, on the extent to which unemployment falls. Unemployment in itself falling and incomes rising uh, brings in more tax revenues. So even though we reduced the USC last year, for example, um, tax revenues are up. They're not up as, we th as much as we thought they would be, uh, but they are up because there's more people working and there's more people earning more and there's more people spending more in the economy. Um, we translate that into this thing called the fiscal space, but the fiscal space is a real thing and gives us some resource into the future. But I don't rule out um, raising some taxes into the future. You know, in most budgets, for example, we increase taxation on cigarettes. There are other taxes as well. OK, well, let's uh, have a look at what people are saying on the tweet machine. Um, a lot of people, Vincent, are, uh, first of all, a little bit surprised that uh, the Taoiseach says that he only gets up at a quarter to seven. They thought that if he aspired to be a role model for people who get up early, that he might get up a little earlier than that because people are a little bit peeved. Um, also, a lot of people taking uh, issue with uh, the Taoiseach's contention that there are a lot of people who are on the minimum wage who might be defined as middle class. Uh, um, Declan gilmore Cavanagh is one person who says that the middle class, how can Leo say that the middle class are unrepresented when he comes from a dole full of teachers, business owners and farmers? Uh, Daniel Kelly says he knows plenty of people his age who earn a lot more than the minimum wage. None of them would describe themselves as a middle class. Um, a regular theme in some of the con comments this evening, Vincent, is the whole question about equality of opportunity. Uh, David Rossiter says he's tired of hearing the Taoiseach talking about that because it implies the idea that if you're poor, you're lazy. It has a complete disregard for the structural injustices that keep people poor. Uh, and Siobhan also says that how can you possibly reduce inequality and solve the health and housing crises while reducing tax at the same time? Um, loads of questions which we don't have time to get through, but I will read just a couple. Um, Dave O'Keefe wants to know, will Leo make pay equality a reality for firefighters, teachers, nurses? or is that just for RTE staff? Uh, Brian Kerrigan wants to know, was Vincent right when he said that Leo's Tea Party dog whistles were what Leo was all about? And Kate Kelly would like to know Leo's opinion on the fact that Simon Coveney overwhelmingly won the grassroots vote in the leadership contest. Give me the last, person, the last, po the last point. Which, which one? That Simon Coveney won overwhelmingly uh, the vote of Philly Gellers in the leadership contest. Yeah, yeah, he, he did, uh, and I won overwhelmingly um, with the local authority members, the councillors. No, uh, and, and overall, of members of Philly Gale, including the councillors and TDs and senators, uh, Simon won a huge majority. Oh, no, not, well, no, no, no very no, significant. Uh, uh, among among those, who are, who, those who are not, not public reps, uh, among the councillors I won, among but the TDs. The whole together, yeah. The MEPs. Well, the whole together is based on Electoral College, which, which I won 60 40, but. Uh, among members who don't hold any elected office, Simon did win um, by quite a considerable margin. That's that's correct. Do you want to give some of the other points? I've forgotten some of them now. Well, actually, well, one of the things I think that was interesting is is um, is, is is people. I think people mentioned um, um, mentioned mentioned health there, um, and your interest in statistics, and you will know that our health spend on a not on a GDP basis, our, our health spend per person, take our total health budget divided by the number of people. Uh, who live in the state is actually quite high. So uh, it's certainly going to be the case that the solution around health uh, is not just going to be about money. Other countries spend less per head and um, provide a health service that is free with very few charges and uh, one that you can access much quicker than ours. So uh, I think one of the things that I want to transform in politics is this constant uh, false view in Ireland uh, that the solution to our social problems is more resources, throwing more money and more staff at more of the same, as if that'll work, because if it, if it was the thing that worked, it should be working already. Just on the health thing, uh, you said that you had uh, unfinished business in health. 
Why did you have unfinished business? Why didn't you do what you needed to do? Because I, because I wasn't able to, to get done what I needed to do. Um, and why didn't I you did, stay in I did, did some good things, by the way, and I would, uh, would like to see them acknowledge the odd time, obviously bringing in free GP care for uh, kids under six and um, pensions over 70, I think, was an important move towards uh, universal access. Also reversed moves move, move from a point where we were cutting budgets every year where I was able to start getting uh, budgets increased every year and the Children's Hospital now obviously is under construction and we had the Public Health Alcohol bill, bill published so I think I did get some things done but I, what I didn't manage to do is get on top of um, the very serious problem that we have in our health service uh, of access to it, the fact that so many people have to wait so long to access our public health service uh, and the problems that we have uh, in our emergency departments through overcrowding. Um, what, Why didn't what you I, stay what, in health? Why didn't you stay there and to deal with the, what you call unfinished business? Uh, because the teaching of the time moved me to a different department. Um, did you ask to stay in health? I, I didn't. No. Why? Um, I, I did not ask to stay in health either, by the way. What? Uh, I, didn't, I didn't ask to leave either, by the way, but, but we had... But, um, but why didn't you ask to stay? Um, I've never... Been, I've been point, I was pointed to cabin three times. Uh, on no occasion did I go in and make a pitch as to which... Simon, Simon Coveney went in and he said, I want the difficult uh, position of housing minister, and he got yeah. it. Well, uh, I, yeah, I may have had a different relationship with, uh, with the former teacher than I did, but certainly when, you know, on the first but occasion when I became Minister of Transport, Tourism and Sport, as a job I was... You're not that diffident. When I was you, health as a job I was... You're not that well. diffident. You could have said, look, at uh, and uh, I want... A, Stick it out in health. They want, I've unfinished business. Yeah, we did have a conversation about um, the kind of things that uh, I thought needed to be done uh, in health if we were really going to turn it around. Um, and there was never any real response or reply to that. And subsequently, I was moved to a different department. OK, just finally, we have huge problems in this country. We have a housing crisis, we have a homelessness crisis, and I, the numbers of people, the record numbers of people homeless uh, this evening. Uh, and Peter McFerry was, uh, I've forgotten, it's, it's uh, nearly 8,000 and a third of those are children. Um, we have obviously a massive problem with the infrastructure and water. We have a huge problem in the Gardaí. Uh, we've problems with Brexit, problems in Northern Ireland, and all of that. Are you daunted by all this? Uh, no, I'm um, looking forward to, to the challenge and um, attacking those problems head on and turning them around. And I've, you know, you mentioned all the troubles that we have in this country. We have lots of them, um, but I'm also conscious of the things that are going in the right direction. You know, 30,000 more people at work uh, today than uh, six months ago. Uh, the fact that we've allowed. Um, we've been able to provide resources for an extra 950 special needs assistance uh, starting in the next couple of weeks. Uh, so I've seen plenty of things go in the right direction as well. Problems that uh, five or six years ago looked daunting, uh, looked perhaps um, unsolvable, uh, and we've managed to solve some of those. Unemployment is a third of what it was uh, only five okay, years just ago, for example. Easy. So, why, you know, why, I'm the, I, I want to take that approach and, and okay. add up to us and that confidence to those, those other oh, OK, that's fair enough. Um, but uh, just on the issue of housing, why doesn't the state just build houses, get on with it and build um, several th uh, 30, 40, 50,000 houses, as Fianna Fáil did in, in government in the early 1930s? Yeah, the, well, the state is building houses and that is absolutely but not, part not of the solution. That, to that not, not enough. Um, it has ramped up, by the way. Uh, there are 3,000 social houses under construction at the moment. There were 1,000. That's pathetic. Yeah, but you have to ramp these things up. Um, we stopped building houses for far too long uh, in Ireland for lots of reasons. We're now back in the space where the state is building houses again, building social houses. There are 3,000 under construction now at the moment in Ireland. There are 1,000 under construction this time last year. So we've gone up from 1,000 to 3,000. We're going to go, go up further. Uh, we've actually included in, in the Rebuilding Ireland plan um, enough funds to increase our total social housing stock by a third. That's pretty significant. You know, we got the entire history of the state got us at this point. We're going to go up a third again. I think we we'll probably need to do more than that. And as part of the review that uh, Mr. Murphy is carrying out, um, we're looking again at the existing plan we have to buy houses off the private sector and lease houses off the private sector, and asking ourselves if maybe instead of doing that, uh, we should just just build even more than we intend to build. Um, so that's part of it. Another part of it is going to be action around vacant properties. There are a lot of vacant properties uh, in the country. Um, some of those could be renovated and brought into use. Uh, some could be purchased. Uh, and I think we need to impose penalties on people who uh, leave houses vacant in areas where there's very high demand okay. for housing and, uh, and those houses should be in use. I assume you have another two years as Taoiseach before the next election. What do you hope to have achieved by then? 
Well, a couple of things. Um, obviously, what I want to make sure is that we have uh, good stewardship of the economy. Uh, I don't want us to repeat the mistakes of the past. I want us to balance the books next year and start paying down our debt and being very prudent for the future. Um, I want to secure Ireland's position at the centre of the world. I've talked about Ireland being an island at the centre of the world, an open, trading, prosperous economy with lots of connections with different parts of the world and very much at the heart of Europe, the common European home which we help to build. I want to raise living standards and do that in lots of different ways, uh, allowing incomes to rise through salary increases, wage increases, reducing taxation, improving some welfare. Uh, I do want to make some real progress in those very difficult areas, such as health and housing. I don't think it's going to be possible to solve those things in two years, but I think we can do a lot in those, in those spaces. Uh, and also as well, um, I very much want Ireland to be uh, a leader. Uh, in the big generational challenges that face uh, our world, areas like climate change and international development, where I think, to a certain extent, we've become a laggard. We've fallen behind on our international commitments. Um, and I want us to uh, become a leader again in those areas. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for being with us. Thank you. Can, okay. I, can, I say, can I say one last thing? I, I, I know you don't want this, but I'm going to do it anyway. I just wanted to, um, particularly on a personal level, to, to thank you, um, first of all, for giving me the opportunity to... Uh, get on radio and TV originally uh, on your RT radio show and on this programme in years gone by. Um, I think uh, you've been tough, but you've been fair. Uh, and even when you haven't been fair, um, I've always admired your integrity, uh, your ability to uh, make politicians squirm, uh, your power of elucidation, which I think has been really important, uh, and your ability as a journalist to ask questions that other journalists would never ask. Uh, so, best you, of luck in the future. You've ruined my reputation. You've just ruined my <laughs> reputation. <laughs> um, actually, just about you, I say, I say about you, I, I, I think I said it recently too, uh, that um, I, I was struck by you at the beginning. Uh, you were on the programme one night, and you were sitting next to me, and there was a woman sitting beyond uh, beyond you and you said something and she completely refuted what you said i've no recollection what it was about but you said oh i was wrong wasn't i and i thought it was really refreshing that somebody instead of going through the usual blather would um acknowledge that but also i used to argue with you about um e equality stuff and we used to correspond a bit about an equality thing and i thought you had an open mind on it and um, i hope you still have I, I, I reserve the right to be, um, to, be, to be wrong again, but I'm, I'm glad you conceded that the country is uh, becoming more equal and poverty is now falling. And these, these are the 2015 figures. <laughs> the, um, the 2016 <laughs> figures will be better again, and if uh, I stay in power, they'll be better after that yet again. Leo, thank you very much. Thank you. OK, back after the break. Now, John, by John Barton, uh, sorry, will you, will you, Michal Martin, uh, um, <laughs> what's your name again? Mario Rosenstock. <laughs> Mario Rosenstock. <laughs> by Louisa Dahl, uh, who you all know, uh, Owen Marco, who unfortunately you all know, <laughs> and uh, also Michelle Murphy, who you probably know as well, social justice, and, and Gavin Riley is still on the tweet machine. What do you think of Leo? I wasn't impressed by the thing overall. I think the sort of statements of oh, someone on the left is saying this, it was too glib. But the really important point was, I have no idea after that interview, what is his vision for the way the country should go, uh, particularly with the problem of Brexit, the attitudes of the EU, which Brian Cowan refers to in his speech mentioned in The Times. We don't know what he really wants to do, except that he's concerned about the middle class. Uh, and I think you made the point very well. What about the rest? Um, Michelle, what do you think? Well, I suppose, yeah, I suppose I'd, I'd still like to hear social and economic priorities of the country. I, you know, a 10-year capital plan would be welcome, but what's your 10-year plan for the country? And I suppose what you pointed out, too, in terms of the revenue units and what the median income is, uh, you know, belies the fact that, you know, people think they're overtaxed in terms of income tax. We're not. But if we are going to improve people's living standards, which is what the Taoiseach wants to do, and I presume he wants to improve everyone's living standards, then you have to invest in the services and bring down the cost of living. I think. I disagree. I, th I think he's very interesting. I like the fact that he's young. I one of our youngest Taoiseachs. I think he Be takes young. a brief. Yes, I do. I think he takes a brief very well. I think he's very articulate. He's competent. 
Um, I, I like one. the idea of a republic of opportunity, and I like to see over the next year or two, if he's in power, um, to bring that through. And I do think the small things do matter at times because they make up the larger things. And he got maybe bogged down a bit on social is, protection. Is, is, is he better than, than Enda? It's not a case of better. You, he, he's no. very different. Is he's he very better? different, is and he it's better? a new. Is he more plausible than Enda? <laughs> well, I was very loyal to End and a great respect but for End, and I'm not going to give us your dissipate that opinion. this evening. Give us your honest opinion. Is Leo a significant improvement on End? He's a very different person. Yeah, we know that. And, he's, and, he's that, and so, because of that, is he much better? <laughs> he, he is a very different Taoiseach. Oh, yes, it's very strong. And in that way, uh, he uh, would be better. He would be better. But the difference is always you ask a, You ask her a question, Mario. Well, as you said during the break, Vincent, when we were off air, um, I think he is one of the most adept performers I've ever seen in my life. I did not really, say that. You did. You did. I did, did say it. <laughs> and may I say, this is extremely unusual to be actually facing you, uh, down with those dirty eyes looking at me. You did. You said it. I heard you. Mary Louise O'Donnell, North Korea heard you. You said it. Heard you. Everybody heard you. Everybody heard you except you. You said it. You said he's one of the most adept performers I've ever come across. Better than that clown who I or uh, Ender Kenny before him and all those, oh, no. all, all those other regions. <laughs> now you shut up, just because you <laughs> <laughs> You did say it. We've got to go to a break. Back in all right, right, back on. <laughs> <laughs> She's going to dispense with the 30 seconds and just do a very gushing tribute to you, but Leo beat me to it, so I'll just say what he said and actually move on to the tweets. Uh, Peter O'Dwyer says that Leo's comment, you've been tough but fair, when, even when you haven't been fair, is actually the most Leo Varadkar compliment he thinks he's ever heard. Uh, Mary Regan says that with the Taoiseach's flattery, we finally have a politician capable of making Vincent squirm, uh, squirm which is nice role reversal after all these years. Uh, some people were disappointed, not much discussion on education or on the possibility of a referendum on the Eighth Amendment, but we can't get to everything. Uh, Mark Smeehan says that Leo is very heavy on generalities, aspirations, etc. But if you strip those away, he stumbles. It's a veneer of caring in that hole. And still a lot of people talking about his comments on the middle class. Stefan O'Brien says, minimum wage is the new middle class. Unemployed is the new working class. Dead is the new welfare class. And Isis Kovacs sums it up pretty nicely. She says, the Irish Prime Minister just went on li live national TV and declared that those on the minimum wage are now middle class. A post-truth post extravaganza, she says. Hashtag Vin B for your comments. I don't think he said that. I think he said that a lot of people who are maybe not including people on the minimum wage, but a lot of people who are pretty poor they consider themselves middle class. But in any event, um, let's go to the front page of tomorrow morning's newspapers. We start with the Irish Times uh, and it leads with Cowan, as Brian Cowan accuses EU of falling, failing Ireland in bank crisis. And there he is pictured with uh, Bertie Ahan and he got an honorary degree today of Doctorate of Laws at um, the National University. Over on the right, uh, Frank Clark only named to be to go to cabinet as chief justice, and nursing home residents cruelly treated. The U UN told, Cork cruise liner Bonanza tourism expansion, uh, cabinet unanimous in making Clark chief justice. Juror vomited at sight of Irishman's injuries. In the Irish Ireland edition of the London Times, air quality fears over a flood of UK diesel cars, and Khan deeply regrets to 250,000 lost jobs, and hold your bladder and health and head to the chipper to treat jellyfish stings. And the John Letty, almost uh, 1,300 kilometres of old, old water pipes will be replaced around Ireland in five years. Um, Brian Khan, I'm glad that he gets a bit of recognition. Mm, yeah. uh, that he, he, of course, shared responsibility for getting us into the crisis, primarily as Minister of Finance, and he was in difficulties dealing with it shortly after he became Taoiseach. But he's a decent fellow and also a very able fellow and wasn't there long enough to make an impact. Yeah, I think one of the points he makes, and it, it is an important point, is the pressure he was coming under just before the crisis came was to spend more and to, um, to as it like, throw the money uh, aside. And the very people who pressed him most on that, when the crash came, then turned around and said, oh, this was all a mistake, should never have happened, and yet they wanted the same. Mario, or whoever you are now. Mario, yeah. Mm. Cowan. Mm. Uh, well, I mean, I think the general perception is that he possibly froze as Taoiseach, that he was a very 
um, an exceptional minister for finance in terms of his um, gusto and in terms of his you know ability to push things through but that he kind of froze in the role as Taoiseach. I mean, events conspired to help him freeze. Yeah. I think he found it difficult to uh, get into his stride. And I was surprised that Leo didn't say that. Yeah, he's finding it difficult. Uh, but uh, Brian Collins certainly didn't have the time to get into his stride. Mario, uh, sorry, Mary Louise. Um, <clears throat> I was like, glad to see it as well, because it has been very tough on him since he left the office. And um, it's, it's a... It's a, a something that is conferred on most ex Taoiseach in this doctorate. And he, you know, I, I thought that the, the photograph was interesting with um, Bertie Ahern standing beside him looking rather furtively. Um, it is um, the dodgiest it, photo yeah. you could ever hope to see. I mean, there's a, it is a really dodgy I looking took photo. From it, you know? I mean, the only... Uh, Why? What's dodgy about it? It's just suspicious looking. Bertie <laughs> looks very suspicious looking. There's a sense of mafia godfather. And just the that people bit in where the Joe background. Pesci goes, I'm going to be a made man, I'm going to be a made... <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, the only thing dodgier, the, the, only thing dodgier the Irish Times could have put on the front page is Shawnee Fitzpatrick okay. winning the lotto. All right, yeah. <laughs> OK, well, I, we've got to go, and I want to thank all of you, Maria, Mary, uh, Mary Louise, Owen and Michelle, for all your contributions to the programme over the years. And thank, and, you. And thank, and thank you. you. And thank you. And also, you. Gavin, <laughs> thank you, Gavin. OK, that's it for now. For more tonight's programme, I'll go on to TV3.e. The weather's next. Thank you.